Uh, hi, welcome to my talk. My um, project I've been working on for the, almost a year now. Uh, it's an open source smartwatch uh, where the application is built using Zephyr. Um, so what this talk is about is what you see here. It's a little bit about what a ZS watch is, um, some background about the project, why I built it, and then we will go into more details about the, the hardware, the, the hardware selection, uh, software, applications um, for the watch. First, a little bit about me. I'm an uh, embedded developer and uh, I've been at uh, Ublox for about six years now and working lately with Zephyr slash NRF Connect on uh, Nordic MCUs. Um, yeah, privately, I, I tend to do a lot of hobby projects. I always have some, some project running uh, on the side, uh, often including mechanic, mechanical design and 3D printing, and of course, programming. Uh, it's fun, fun when, when things move, right? Um, yeah. Often I've been using the, the ESP32, uh, but not for this project. It wasn't a good fit here. Okay, so what is ZS Watch? Yeah, it's, it's called ZS Watch because yeah, it's a lack of imagination from my side. Uh, it, like all uh, smartwatch names I could think of was already taken. Um, so in the end, I, I, it, what inspired the name was the ZMK project, uh, the Sephira mechanical, mechanical Keyboard. Uh, so I kind of copied the, the naming scheme from that one. Uh, yeah, and, and the hardware, so the project, it contains all the KiCad files for the PCB, uh, the casing, so the mechanical case, uh, and the, the files for that. I've made a, a dock, and the, the, of course, the, the full bomb. Uh, on, on the software side, I have, there is the, the Cipher-based application and applications that run on the, the watch also as part of this application. Yeah, so here on the right, you can see the, the different parts, the PCB and the casing, display, uh, vibration motor, and so on. So first, some, some background. So why, why build a smartwatch? And this is why. And it's a long story, or actually, it's quite short. And, and Everyone keeps telling you that this is the end of all your free time. You will no, not have any time to work on any hobby projects anymore. And what happens next is you have a small panic attack because what to do now? So you have to come up with a, a master plan how to solve this. And somewhere in the back of my head, I, I thought that maybe there is like one hour or two every now and then where, which I could use to work on some project. And eventually, this is why I ended up building the, the smartwatch, because it's a, it's a good foundation and you can have a lot of features. Uh, I didn't want to have to think about what to implement. So let's say you have one or two hours. I don't want to sit down for one hour and think of what feature I want to implement. Uh, if you do a smartwatch, you just look at what does other smartwatches do, and I will just copy the same features. So that takes some time. And if I don't want to do that, then I can sit down and maybe come up with something new. I don't know. Uh, yeah, so endless of possibilities. Uh, and lots of late nights later, actually nine months later, there's a baby and an open source smartwatch. Uh, and that's the story behind it. Okay, so let's move on and get into more details about the Cipher part of the smartwatch. So I had some requirements, uh, them being BLE, of course, because you want to have a continuous connection with your, your phone, and it has to be low power, because a smartwatch, you don't want to have to recharge it every day. You want it to run for at least a week and maybe even more. And 
I needed like an MCU and the an ecosystem that uh, would help me to not having to reinvent the wheel because it, I had this limited time, so like nine months, so I didn't have time to write everything. Um, and yeah, something with a big ecosystem. And that, that's where Nordic MCUs for their low power and that I've had experience working with them before in work. Uh, because I didn't want to add another thing that I was not uh, familiar with for this project. And uh, yeah, Noripa Seferis. Uh, obvious, does all my, um, full, uh, yeah, all my requirements are met. And some extra nice features, I think, from using Sefer, which is, from what I know, is quite unique for this ecosystem, is that I can say that everything is completely open source. So everything from the highest level application in my software, like a flashlight application, down to the lowest level radio code, thanks to the open source Bluetooth controller uh, that's part of Zephyr. Uh, I think this is quite cool. Okay, so now s some things about the hardware. And Zephyr played a big part in selecting the hardware for my project, uh, mostly because of the um, small or short time frame where I really wanted to have most of the foundation done by the nine months. Hence, I really had to optimize the selection of the, the components. Um, so I didn't have any time to write too many drivers. I needed uh, drivers that were already implemented and known to work. I also didn't have time to sit down and debug I2C buses for errors and so on, because you know that the hours, they just fly by when you, you dig down into that. And actually how I selected most of the, the components on my watch was by browsing the driver's directory in Zephyr. And this is quite nice because it's, it's huge, as you know. And um, yeah, you're browsing around, finding kind of what features the sensors had implemented in Zephyr and what they, they could do uh, when I came down to the, the ones I have right now. And also my PCB design knowledge was not too big. This is actually the first one uh, I've done. So I tried to stay with ICs that were kind of easy to use and didn't require a lot of external components. Uh, so I tried ICs that kind of did everything internally. And also because of the limited PCB size, this was kind of a trade-off between uh, the size of the ICs I would use and the solderability, because I would be hand soldering everything. So all of this was kind of a trade-off also. Okay, so what did I end up with? So I eventually did two versions of my uh, smartwatch, where the first version, uh, did work really good actually, uh, just some small patches. And uh, this is, was the foundation for most of the software development I've done for the, the smartwatch. Uh, it features the NRF 52833, uh, which I eventually grew out of because I, the both RAM and the flash was completely filled at the end. Uh, as soon as you do like UIs and things like this, it will just eat up flash and, and also there's not a, a lot of RAM on it, which then I ended up with the version two where I upgraded pretty much everything. So it features the NRF 5340 with much more RAM and flash. And I kind of reworked a lot of parts to make it easier to build up and uh, solder. So these are, are the, the software features for my, sorry, hardware features for my version two, which is also the latest version I have. So yeah, as I said, the NRF 5340 has the MCU and Bach BME 688 environmental sensor, which can do like air quality measurements and you can even deploy some AI models or something on it uh, to kind of smell. Nothing I've tried out, but it's there and you can do whatever you would want with it. I've added a magnetometer I, I don't know why actually, because 
does anyone use the Compass app on your watches? I don't know. But I had some extra space, so I threw it in, because why not? And also this uh, pressure sensor, which I think is quite nice. Uh, it can detect like 20 centimeters or something change in air pressure, so it could be used for some cool software features. An IMU for uh, yeah, accelerometer and gyro for yeah, like gesture detections and things like this. Also nice with this IMU is that it has some uh, ge uh, gesture detection built in, which saves me some time, so I don't have to implement that also. And uh, a capacitive touch screen, circular, 240 by 240 pixels. And lastly, a haptics vibration driver for the vibration motor to get some nice haptic feedback on the watch. And also there's this pulse oximeter and heart rate sensor, which is there, it works. You can read raw data from it, but I have no, no algorithm for it because it turns out it's quite complicated to get all of that working and combine, you need to combine it with the accelerometer movings and all of that, so I just haven't focused on that. And also it made the, the mechanical casing design a bit harder because it sits on the bottom side. Uh, so for now I haven't mounted it on the watches I've built as of now. Okay, some, some conclusions from selecting driver sensors from Sefer driver's directory. And I think it would be good if more vendors kind of provided more official driver support of Zephyr because it's, it's growing fast. And with Nordic, they're quite huge also. So it's, I think it's a good selling point for some vendors to provide more official drivers. Because right now there's a lot of drivers, community maintained, but they, at least the ones I have been working with, kind of lacks more of the advanced features on the, from the the, the sensors. Um, so in, in the end, actually, I ended up porting the, for the Bosch sensors their Bosch libraries to Zephyr instead. Ideally, the good best way would have been to update the drivers in Zephyr, but I just didn't have time for that. And also, I learned uh, the ship shortage was, is a pain, so I feel the pain from the hardware engineers at my work. And uh, I had to do like three redesigns because of, yeah. You know, components just, you cannot buy them anymore. Okay, so on to the software. So now it's time to bring the hardware to life with Zephyr. So first thing you will meet is this, the device tree. And what you will do for the hardware bring up, we'll create the board, the ZS watch board, based on the NRF340 DK. We'll you'll add like one sensor at a time. So the hardware specifics for the ZS watch. And you get this a lot of times, at least if you're me. Uh, but eventually you fix this small typo and you iterate until you have all of the sensors and all of your components brought up. Uh, yeah, eventually it's all working and your hardware is fine. And this is actually a true story. So everything kind of worked on the first try, which is, Nice for me. Yeah. No. Yep. Like I said, jokes aside, it was quite smooth. And if you've been working with the device tree since before, it's it's quite nice. Uh, it's it's a, it's a steep learning curve, I would say. Which, but I've this is past in the past now, so it was uh, smooth for this project. Uh, okay. Moving on to the actual software. Um, so my idea for the architecture is to kind of keep everything as clean as possible. So I, w I wanted to separate files as much as possible. So the, like a module-based software is not nothing, not anything new, but uh, it's something I, I, I wanted. So I took heavy use of the Sysinit macros from, from Zephyr and tried to separate all the, like have no dependencies between all of, all of my C files. Uh, I w I'm using the ZBus, the Zephyr messaging bus for all the communications within the application and yeah, for, for propagating data. Uh, and as much, I, I tried to separate the code as much as poss possible. So anything that, I, that could be made as an kind of standalone application 
for the watch, I try to separate that from everything else. It's like settings and all of that. It's just, it's a separate chunk of C files with not too much dependencies to the rest of the system. Okay, so a little bit about how I designed the, the smartwatch architecture. So the, 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 the base of all of it is the Z bus, which, uh, which propagates the data uh, between all of the different modules in the watch. So for example, you have the charging manager. It, all it does is to look for when someone, when the charger is plugged in. When that happens, there's an event published on the, on the bus and whoever listens on it can act on it. And like the battery manager will sample the battery periodically and publish these samples or slash measurements to the, to the vessel bus. Yeah, and the communication from the phone. So when there's, for example, a notification the, from the phone and this is sent to the watch, uh, the communication manager will, manager will publish, publish this to the bus and subscribers can, or listeners actually can act on it. Uh, then you have power manager, which handles kind of um, to keep the, the power consumption down. Uh, when the watch is in idle and when you have apps and things like this that also listen on the bus to act on things like gestures and accelerometer movement and things like this. Uh, so moving on to low power. Uh, for, for me, low power was, was very important for, the, for my, my watch. So I tried to get everything from the hardware for at, uh, first to be capable of being really low power, but uh, you also need to take many considerations in the software to keep power consumption down. Uh, and for the watch, the, the main kind of contributor to high power consumption is a display. It consumes a lot of power, so at 60 milliamps at full brightness. Uh, so it's quite, it's important to keep, keep the display off as much as possible. Uh, so this is just a simple example how like the wake up uh, works. And that is, you have the power manager, will, which will look for uh, idle timeout. So for example, uh, after 40 seconds I have right now, the watch will go into an idle state and turn off the display and there will be an event sent to, on the Z bus that we're now entering low power mode and every, everyone that can act on this in the system. And then you have the IMU. So when you do a wrist wake up gesture, uh, it there's an event sent and the system can wake up. Yeah. And uh, with Sephiroth, this is super easy to do uh, with the power management APIs. Uh, so yeah, I have two, two options. Either I can cut power to the display in the touch chip and then they will consume literally zero microamps because I have a separate 3.3 uh, volt, uh, volts uh, regulator powering these parts of the watch, or I can put them into sleep mode. And this is a trade-off between power consumption when, when the watch is idle and the, the, the wake-up time uh, from, from like the sleep mode to the active mode. There's like a one, almost one second uh, of lag when you boot the display, for example, from from power off. Yeah. And uh, you have the, the Cypher reg regulator APIs, which makes all of this quite simple to use. Yeah, and there was also another thing that I uh, had, uh, that I had to take into consideration in the, when you have many standalone things in the system, and that is, let's assume you have 10, 10 different modules that needs to do something periodically, like once per second. And all of them will kind of use uh, the delayed work to do this uh, independently when you, you end up with 10 wake-ups wake ups per second, which could uh, be eliminated to just one uh, in actually. So this is something I've implemented to kind of save, adi uh, yeah, save additional power. Yeah, so my solution was kind of to split it into different, you have like s slow events, medium events and fast events. And the modules can subscribe, listen on these events on the, on the bus. Yeah, so this is the power consumption measured right now. Uh, you get around maybe eight days with uh, the display 
in the more power consuming mode where it just goes down to sleep mode. And if you disable the regula regulator, the, the PCB and the hardware can go into a quite nice low power mode. Uh, and it's also super easy to break the power consumption when you do some coding and then you, you make a small phase change and then everything consumes a lot of power. So this is something I need to add like some kind of way of automatically uh, measuring the power consumption so in, I don't break it all the time. Okay, so moving on to the, the user interface. Uh, the user interface is quite important for at least for non-technical -te people because when they have a smartwatch, all they care about is what they see on their wrist. And, and the, the smartwatch is what they see, that's the UI. So for UI, I'm using LVGL, which is a super great UI library for embedded devices. Uh, it supports everything I could imagine. It, it has like features that I didn't think you could do on embedded, fe features that I expected only to have on desktop UI frameworks. And it also takes care of button, button navigation and through the, the Zephyr LVGL K-Scan port, it ha also takes care of uh, the touch input on the display. So here on the right, you can see kind of the, at least what the watch face uh, looked like a few weeks ago. And it, all of this was quite simple to build with LVGL because it has like widgets for these round things that you can just tell it to what percentage they should be filled and uh, all of that. Okay, so moving on to applications or apps within the watch. What you see here is what I call the application picker. So it's just a, a long list of all applications currently on the watch. And this is where you launch apps from. Uh, here's just some, some examples of what uh, some apps I have right now. So you can control music on your phone, for example, and you can watch the, the battery uh, status. I've made it kind of a, a, a settings system that can automatically prop, uh, fill in the UI depending on a list of uh, settings and settings types. Uh, you, of course, you can have notifications on your pop-up notifications. You can see in the middle one, uh, not looking too fantastic, but it's, it's all work in progress. Just a small demo of what it the responsiveness of the, the touch. So you can see it's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty good. Uh, there's, there's more work to, uh, to be done to further optimize uh, the LVGL port of, um, uh, yeah, LVGL port and other things. And you can also do kind of uh, swipes and gestures on the watch face to quickly enter a specific app and so on which is uh, quite handy to not have to go through the application picker. Okay, so some basic uh, about applications in the watch. So I, I tried to keep it super simple. So an application is just this struct. You have a start function, stop function. You have a name and an icon. The name and the icon is what you see in the application picker upright. Uh, so this is what will be populated here. And each application have to call the application manager add application through the sysinet macro. So each application kind of adds themselves to the system. Uh, so I, I thought it would be a, a fun idea to let's create an app here to see uh, yeah, how it's done. So let's say our requirements is to show the Zephyr logo. And when the screen is touched or a button is pressed, we will rotate it. And the first thing we need to do to do that is we need to find an icon for the application manager. And in this size, uh, we need to find the Zephyr project logo, which we will be rotating. And we just use the online tool from LVGL to convert these images to C files. And then we put it in the images folder. Okay, so what we need, first we create a folder for the, the new application we'll be creating, the ZDS, so Zephyr Developer Summit app. We need a CMake file, just compile everything here. 
the actual application that you can see here pop is populating the this struct with the app name and icons and the start and stop functions. Uh, and you can see this is in it uh, initializing or adding this application to the picker. Then we have the UI, we need a header file for that. So my idea was to you separate the logic from the UI. So with this makes it easier to uh, like, yeah, keep it separated and it also allows to uh, run the UI easier on uh, a desktop simulator for LVGL. And in the UI, we will create the icons or the images that we will be rotating. We'll add a button and add listeners to, to those to uh, handle the rotation. So in the button pressed, we just rotate the, the, the image a bit. And this is what we get. So you can see the ZDS entry in the application picker with the Zephyr Kite icon, and if you press on the screen, you'll see the, the logo is rotated. And we can also, if we want, extend the application. For example, if we are interested in events from the IMU, for example, if the user wiggles their, what, uh, their wrist, we can listen on that event, and when that happens, we can reset the rotation back to original on the Zephyr project logo. So and this is kind of how you would do that. And our application can also listen on power events. So when we're going into inactive and active state, in case the application is doing something that keeps the watch awake, then we can, the application or whoever wants to listen to those events can handle that accordingly. Yeah, and all of this is done. You use the ZBus listener uh, macros to add. Uh, yeah, callbacks for these events. Yeah, and also thanks to Zephyr and all of the magic behind the scenes, you can run it on Linux uh, through the native POSIX port using SDL for the display window. And actually you can also have the Bluetooth up and running using the HCI USB sample on any development kit or development board that's supported. And all of this just works kind of out of the box in Linux. You just plug in the, 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 um, the USB uh, uh, sample and it's detected automatically. And this was super nice. It, I've, I've postponed this for a while because I thought it was be more, a lot of work, but in the end it was just one night and everything just worked. Uh, just some small changes I had to do in the application and some things to get a Billy working and a small change in the S display SDL because if you have a high resolution screen, you get the 240 by 240 window, which is super small, but there are some handy functions in SDL to just upscale the window. Yeah, so it saves a lot of time on not having to reflash all the time. And it allows anyone to kind of play around with the, the ZS Watch software on their own desktop computer. This is just a small uh, demo of it up and running. And you can see through the SDL port, you can get user input, you can navigate around uh, the system and all of that works. And here we have the app we just created and we can click on the screen and it will rotate the logo. And we can also see that since I have Bluetooth up and working in a second, there will be a you can send, receive notifications from your phone here, and they will pop up on the screen. Okay, uh, part of this project is also that I've made a dock, so you can easily program the watch, easily charge it through a USB cable. So the dock exposes the, the GPIOs you need, uh, power and programming pins, and one additional GPIO that could be used for uh, anything you'd like. Uh, right now, uh, I, I will, I'm also working on a different kind of dock version without a debugger because that requires a license and yet you can only get from me and so on. So there will be another release of the dock soon, which without the debugger capabilities and some small fixes. So the idea is you just put the watch on top of it and it will just, it just works. Uh, for the casing, it's a 3D printed case. 
it's not 100% yet, but it, it works pretty good. Uh, but you can always, always improve. And actually one of the biggest hurdles in this project was this connector to the dock. So I've been thinking for months trying to find some, I wanted some magnetic uh, pogo pin connector, but it was yeah, really hard to find something that was also very low profile because uh, I didn't want to make the watch too thick just because of it. So in the end, I, I picked a super simple solution and found a low profile uh, uh, pin header, which is like two millimeters high. For the communication with uh, the phone, I'm using the, also an open source application, the Gadget Bridge app, which is an, an, an app application for people that don't want to use like Samsung app, the Samsung apps or Google apps or Huawei apps for their wearable devices. Uh, and this one supports a lot of smartwatches from other, yeah, other smartwatches. And what I do here is to just fake being another supported smartwatch uh, in the Gadget Bridge app, and it will automatically just send me everything I need. And it just works out of the box. And it also has a lot of features so, uh, that I have not yet utilized on my watch. Okay, so how much will it set you back? Somewhere around $120 uh, is the, the full bum for the hardware, which I think is uh, quite affordable from what you get. And the dock is yeah, it's super cheap, just a two, two layer PCB with a few components. And, and what's next for the project? I, I'm not sure, I, I will see. But some ideas I have, at least right now, is to improve the uh, LVGL port in Zephyr because it's not handling double buffering, display rendering correctly. So even if you use turn on double buffering, it's actually not utilizing it. So there's no performance gain from turning it on. So I think this will help a lot with, uh, to get even more responsiveness in the UI. Uh, I want also to improve the native post export because it was a one evening hack and so there's some more cleanup to do to get all the edge cases to work. And also I found this new sensing subsystem, I think uh, for Zephyr, I think this would be a good fit where you have uh, many modules that want to read from the same sensor and I think this is all handled as part of this uh, new subsystem. Yeah. And then some, some, some more rework uh, and more improvements for the power consumption to get even more power, battery life out of it. And lastly, some, some hardware changes that would be nice to use the uh, PMIC to vent that way I can el eliminate a few components on the PCB. And I think it will make room for an external flash chip also. And in the future, it would be nice to even crank more power and use the new NR54 H20 chip, uh, maybe. It seems quite nice and powerful. And that allows even, even more use cases for, for the watch. So, conclusions. Yeah, it, this wouldn't be possible with, uh, without the big ecosystem as Zephyr, with a lot of good documentation, a lot of samples, uh, and a lot of code already in place. Uh, so I, I could really focus on my application and not uh, all of the layers below it. And I also learned that I should have done the post export a long time ago. It probably saved me a lot of time, but yeah, you, you learn. Yeah, and also some another additional bonus if because of the, the hardware have quite a few sensors. So if you just not don't mount the display and the vibration motor, you have a quite nice powerful, low power uh, board for uh, sensors that, that could be used for, for anything. Yeah, and that's, that's it. And you can find all of it on uh, this GitHub page and uh, all the documentation and so on. And feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And we can also do, if, uh, if there's questions in here, we can take them now. Yes, <laughs> of course.
course, <laughs> always. You have to. I, I'm the main tester of it. So. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So if your app crashes, you lost your time. Sorry. If your app crashes, you. Uh, if if okay. So what happens if my app crashes? Yes, yeah. You right now. Yep. So if it crashes, I'm keeping the, the clock in, in uh, RAM retention. So if it crashes, it's still there, uh, at least. So that's how I keep the time right now. And when, when the watch wakes up, the application, the, the phone application will automatically connect to the watch and also send the latest time information. So the, the clock is kind of all, almost always uh, correctly. There's no clock in the watch, so it's just using the internal clocks on the Nordic chip MCU. So it's not, it will drift, but for me, you, you always have your phone on you, and if you send the, an updated time, like every now and then, that you will, you will not drift away too much. Uh, yes? Uh, since you're working at u -blocks, any plans that you use the u module with the GPS would be not getting real okay. precise? Yeah, so the, the question about if I would consider using a GPS within the watch, and I, I, I've thought about this, and because I've designed this for, for me and what I wanted, and I, I didn't want a GPS because I always have a phone on me, so I, I didn't see the, the need of a GPS. It's just more complexity and more code and uh, more things that consume power. Yes. We've seen numbers eight days of uh, charge to charge, right? Is it so in reality, uh, measured in reality, or is it like the numbers that we calculated? Yep, so about the power consumption was asked. And if it's, if uh, by my measurements were uh, real life measurements or calculated, and the answer is that they are uh, measurements based on my usage for, uh, for a day. And I could see that uh, I had the screen on for about 3% of the day. Um, so it's, it's kind of calculated, but depending on the bugs in my code, the power consumption will move up and down during my development because I, I keep breaking it. <laughs> it's, it's super easy. Yeah. Uh, yes? When you keep track of the hours spent and GPS, how many hours did you spend and what is the proportion between hardware and software? Um, mostly software. Uh, that, ab ab about the time spent uh, on the project. Most of the time I spent on, on software development. Uh, there were some kind of startup time that took to learn the, the, the PCB design, but I would say maybe one month is PCB design and then yeah, it's like 10 months of software. So, yeah. in the back. If there's a guide uh, how to build it, uh, yes, partly, but also partly not. Uh, so if there's interest, I will spend more time on it. But yeah, as uh, my time is limited, I'm just doing what I feel is most fun at, at the moment. But uh, if there's interest, then that's fun. And uh, then I will do that. So and, yeah, you can get in touch. Uh, but all of the files is there. and. I'm thinking of maybe ordering some, some prototype assembled boards because it's not fun to hand, hand solder a lot of them and it takes, takes hours and it's small. Yes? Do you have to recompile the project for, the, for each new application? I, I need to recompile the project for each application, yes. Uh, Is there a way to avoid that? I think um, there, there's always a way for most things. It's about time and, uh, and effort. I think you can dynamically link in apps, maybe. Uh, I haven't looked into it. Uh, but maybe if someone's good in those parts of uh, software, then let me know. Uh, yes? What do you plan to do when you get your second baby? <laughs> I, I <laughs> yeah. That's something I... Uh, <laughs> my plan, if I have more kids, then that is to... I will, I, I'm not thinking about that right now. So I'm, I'm living happily as is. <laughs> okay, I, I think the, the time's up. So if you have any questions, we can do it afterwards. Or yeah, if we could take a moment and thank him for his presentation. Um, thank you.